This is the Lepac Area Public Library's Lunch and Learn. Today we have our master naturalists with us, and we're going to be learning about being an interpreter in the woods. Help it, they're going to help us understand about nature deficiency disorder, and we're going to be able to appreciate the abundance of plants and animals in our area that enrich our lives. As well as that, they're going to tell us about the program that they went through in order to be master naturalists. We have Mary Trainer and Sue Eiler with us today. Please give them a hand. Thank you, Peg. Everybody here okay? So, you all are drinking some water this morning, and I have two jars of water here for you to look at that I collected this morning here in Wapaka, and we'll pass them around, and so, uh, no, you're not drinking that, please do not drink that, <laughs> and you can see they're slightly different from each other, even though they're from the same sample. What do you think is in there? Algae, okay. And algae is what kind of organism? They're actually protists. So there's a kingdom, protista. They're one-celled organisms. And are there any animals in there? Oh, yeah, lots of animals, okay. Actually, what is the average size of an animal? I was looking for a tadpole. So maybe a tadpole, you think, like this big? Is that, you think, the average size of an animal? That's correct. Woo, you guys are doing good. Microscopic. So most animals are very, very tiny. We can't even see them. And so these specimens are full of uh, animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, protists, full of stuff. That, now, is it bad? That is a complicated question. <laughs> And that's part of what we're doing here today, is we are in a culture that has become a culture where nature is feared. Ooh, don't go near that water. Ooh, don't go in that water. You can get sick. Is that, have you ever heard that? Don't go in the woods because ticks. Snakes, poison ivy, bears, yeah, uh, mountain lions, bobcats, I mean, right? So is there an issue in our overall culture with fear of nature? Was that here in our country 50 years ago, 20 years? No. That's exactly right. And so part of what we're doing here is to, to raise our awareness about what we can do to reduce the issue of nature deficit disorder, which was actually coined by this author. I have a whole table of books up here. You're welcome to come look at just... Uh, I brought these. There's a coloring book, too. This is one of my favorite things. Don't have to have just cutesy fairies or anything. <laughs> you can draw biological organisms for coloring. And this book is very old. It's from the 80s or something, you know. So uh, kind of fun. Peg, I don't know if you got this one, but <laughs> it's kind of a cool book. <laughs> so, uh, so nature deficit disorder, by the way, is not in the psychology DSM-5 uh, book, so don't look for it there. It is not a clinical disorder. That having been said, there is research associated with it. So we're here to share some of that with you today. Uh, in terms of nature, is nature good for our health? Why? 
Why? Fresh air. Fresh air. Okay, just breathing, right? Okay, what else? Beauty. beauty. And beauty is good for our souls, our emotions, our spirituality, right? Just our well-being. Hard to measure, isn't it? <laughs> but it's real. Yes, others. Hiking. Hiking, physical activity. Have you heard the, the term lately that, that uh, sitting is the new smoking? Yeah. Have you heard that? <laughs> sitting is the new smoking? We sit too much. And so being in nature, you tend to, I mean, there's nothing wrong with sitting in nature. It's actually a really good thing to do because you breathe and you admire the beauty and you stop. Are we busy? Isn't that incredible? Even I, I run into so many people who are retired and they say, oh, I'm so busy. <laughs> well, we need to be less busy and nature helps us do that because we can't see what we need to see in nature if we're crazy, right? Have you ever just taken uh, two kinds of walks a nature walk where you just kind of stroll versus you're getting your exercise for the day, right? You're kind of doing this and maybe you got a, got a, um, Peg? Well, the, the data, thank you, Peg, the data is kind of, yeah, new. So it's a little controversial. And actually, the, this guy, there has been some criticism of him uh, because we're in an evidence-based uh, uh, health situation in our country, and the evidence is not as, as definitive as... I, so I, I'm not sure they... You, know, you, you probably could find one study that said yes and one study that said maybe. There, uh, but what I do have is uh, studies by researchers throughout the world suggest exposure to nature is important to good health, results in a positive impact on mental health and well-being, can reduce sadness and negative emotions. Is that an issue in our country? Yes, it very much is. And there is some research to show that children with ADD respond very well to nature therapy. And so there is uh, a, a body of research associated with that. Uh, just yesterday, actually, the National Institutes of Health, I get a newsletter from them online, and a Dr. Philip Smith said, and I quote, uh, studies have found that uh, being exposed to nature can improve mood, reduce anxiety. Boy, is anxiety an issue? Oh, yeah, in our culture. And enhance self-esteem. So that's kind of, so he doesn't, I didn't see the studies, but uh, that was from NIH just this week. So what are the causes of this nature deficit disorder? In other words, being uncomfortable in nature, being uh, more comfortable inside, away from wildness. So what are the causes of really the fear of being out? Technology. Okay, so the media, uh, video games, TV, computers, all that. Okay. Pardon? Big city living. Oh, big city living. So just access. And, and actually they've shown even going out in your yard and for a walk even in the city uh, is still being out. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and then we've already talked about busyness, just time. And that's an, an issue. Uh, uh, so that's back to fear. And so I'm not going in the woods because I might encounter a blank. 
so a tick or a, a poison ivy or uh, um, I, my husband and I go hiking out west all the time. So out there it's, it's snakes. Uh, I mean, and do you know that I have lived for 30 years out west uh, before I went, came back to Wisconsin 12 years ago. And I have been hiking all over the west and I have seen two rattlesnakes and they were just minding their own business. So, and I have spent thousands and thousands of hours hiking out west. So, uh, and I've seen a few grizzly bears too, and they've never been a problem because <laughs> they were far away. Uh, and so, so that fear, where would that, that programming of that fear come from? Okay, so experience. Experience may be by somebody else and sharing the story. Okay. Okay, the media. So what specifically? Okay, but and, and just TV. I mean, Animal Planet and the the you know monster fish and the I mean you know that you watch TV and you think you're gonna go in the woods and you're gonna encounter lions and tigers and bears and uh, you know snakes the cobras that are gonna tra attack you don't you think that because because those pictures on TV they don't tell you that it took 1,000 hours to get that one second video <laughs> right. <laughs> And exactly. So people, we want drama, and yet nature isn't all that dramatic when you get out there, is it? You have to really work at it to see something, which is why we have to be quiet. And yes. It might just be fear of the unknown. Oh, you know, okay. You're going to go yes. hiking, and you've never been on yes. that trail before. Yes. You don't know what is, what's around the bend. And you may be a little hesitant unless you've been there before or are with someone who has done right. it. Un unfamiliarity. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, nobody has mentioned stranger danger, but haven't we been through a time where, you know, I, when I grew up, my parents didn't know where I was. <laughs> grew up in Milwaukee, and we just went out and had fun and kind of left at breakfast and came back at dinner, and they didn't know what we were doing or where we were. You'd think that would happen today? I don't think so. So the kids are, are inside, and we have caused some of that, haven't we? And so we are taking responsibility for that now and paying attention to this disorder and today talking about what we can do about it. Question? trips out and it was really great and the kids loved it but they're kind of dried up these field trips for our school children <coughs> now money. of money. course that all comes down to money but there's always money for something else in the school system but it's taken away from the programs in my estimation well that really count for well, kids. one of the things that we're doing here today is talking about the master naturalist program so sue and i are actually professionals in the field so i have a phd in biology sue has a phd in wapaka uh, plants and animals <laughs> it's just not from a school but it, believe me she's uh, got a doctorate <laughs> and and uh, we are working together uh, through the state of Wisconsin and the Extension Office to train master naturalist volunteers to address the issues we're talking about. We need help. And a lot of the issue has to do with unfamiliarity. Your poison ivy, poison ivy, you, know, you just don't breathe, you don't burn it. And if, you, if it does burn, you don't breathe next to it, okay? You recognize the plant. So somebody has to teach about what, and not all three-leaf plants are poison ivy. So we need to learn to recognize it. And, but it takes somebody to teach people that. And so the Master Naturalist class uh, is a wonderful opportunity to learn. And you don't have to 
get a PhD in biology. You just come and uh, for 40 hours. It's a wonderful program. Uh, and uh, we teach it at Hartman Creek State Park. Our next class, uh, registration is open now, and our next class begins uh, September 17th, actually, and you can register now. Um, so uh, part of what we promised you is to talk about interpretation. The Master Naturalist Program uh, does interpretation, uh, stewardship, and citizen <coughs> science. And all three of those are important ways that, that naturalists work. Interpretation is really, and, and you can see the specimens on your tables, uh, interpretation is defined as a communication process designed to reveal meanings and relationships of our cultural and natural heritage through involvement with objects, artifacts, landscapes, and sites. And interpretation <coughs> involves science and, uh, and all kinds of other things. So it is culture, it is art, and, um, and so if you don't, uh, you can say, oh, I don't know anything about that, don't worry about it. You will learn. And, um, and so part of the program is to empower you uh, to uh, follow the interest area. And actually, we have a graduate, Diana, is here. And so you can talk with her uh, objectively about the program. And she's followed up wonderfully uh, on that. Uh, before we move on, yes, question? What is a personal capstone project? Um, that is something you learn about when you take the class, but it's basically, because it's kind of complicated to describe, it's just a little project that you do as part of the Master Naturalist program. So, and we help you with it. You can do it with, as a team, or it's just got kind of a long description by the state, so you don't need to know that now. It's just a little project you do outside and share about it at the end of the class. That's all. So. And it, it does count as part of your volunteer hours. So it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, question? Um, the class costs $250, uh, which sounds like a lot of money. Uh, but actually, the program is not funded by the state. It comes out of the extension office. Uh, uh, Master Gardeners is quite better funded than Master Naturalists, unfortunately. So the state gets the money. Uh, actually, Hartman Creek State Park does obtain $50. The Friends of Hartman gets $50 uh, for each participant, which goes back into the park. Sue and I don't get paid anything. And so it's, it, it's not like anybody's getting rich. Uh, the program is managed in Madison. Um, through the extension office and actually Ashland, I guess now, and um, and it's uh, that really goes for the materials. There are lots of materials uh, associated with the class. So, I, I, Diana, did you get your money's worth? Oh yes. Um, okay, go. And I'll have to say, I mean, I had a science background, and I still felt like I got my money's worth. I learned more. <coughs> Uh, and questions. Uh, we, we gave you those activities just to, uh, to lunchtime activities to enrich your experience here. Uh, and you were, uh, there were two activities and you guys can share uh, the tables. I gave you a bunch of nature quotes. Anybody want to share from the, uh, the tables that had the nature quotes? Uh, any uh, insights you had? Anybody want to share? That, yeah, if you had specimens, you didn't have the nature quotes. So they're little white cards. Anybody have one you want to share? I do. Yeah. Because it ties in. I have a, a quote from Robert Frost, who was a favorite poet of our family. When I see birches bend to left and right, I like to think some boy's been swinging them. <laughs> and I think that's important because um, I was a lifelong teacher. And I know that children will only pursue what we expose them to, and that we need to continue to commit to getting kids, you know, out of out of the house and into the woods, um, to toward raising another generation that will protect our environment. 
and you can help do that. So the schools are one place, but the parks are another, and actually the number of visitors per year just here at Hartman uh, is something like, I don't know, half a million. Uh, it's really, uh, and we have so many places here, just right in Walpaca, and certainly the state where you can volunteer. Uh, one of the nice things about the Master Naturalist program, because it's throughout the state, is that you can actually volunteer to go, vol uh, to go work at Peninsula Park uh, in their nature center if you are a master naturalist. So that's kind of a cool thing. So it, it's uh, throughout the state. Uh, so I, anybody else want to read their quote? Susan? This one fits right in with your talk. Nature will bear the closest inspection. She invites us to lay our eye level with her smallest leaf and take an insect view of its plane. The one and only Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've seen something, in fact I showed it to Chris's children when they were here once, that a beautiful little insect called a walking stick, which you can, if it's still, you barely see it, and it, if you recognize it. So it looks it, like a stick. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They love chrysanthemums, I've noticed. <laughs> uh, any other, want to read? Yeah. To cherish what remains of the earth and to foster its renewal is our only legitimate hope of survival. And I feel it's really scary to see what humankind is doing to the earth and rainforests disappearing and stuff, but I am happy to say the last four months we spent in Florida, we spent almost all our time at beautiful natural areas that have been set aside. State forests, natural, national forests, parks, and rivers, and, and so I think, you know, there is a movement in Wisconsin that has them too, but just this last four months was amazing, the beauty they are preserving. And, and you can make a difference. <coughs> so um, it, it, actually, if you join Friends of Hartman Creek State Park, they're all, it, it links you up to all kinds of opportunities uh, to learn about preservation of wild lands and, and uh, plants and animals in this yeah, state. These, these places in Florida mm -hmm. are real, there's a lot of springs, we love mm -hmm. the snorkeling, and there are very, a lot of informative signs now mm -hmm. that every visitor who comes in is going to read about how what they do at their home is affecting the groundwater and the spring. Mm -hmm. And so they really have been doing a good job, even over the years that we've gone there, they've really gotten into this, you know, everybody should. And you can do that here, yep. actually, right here in Walpaca. We need more signs. And part of the projects that some people have done in the Master Naturalist is just to design a sign which is actually not easy. <laughs> so, okay, any other quotes? That anybody wants to say, yep, but um, we got both of you, so you guys this take is turns. This from Henry David Thoreau. Each new year is a surprise to us. We find that we had virtually forgotten the note of each bird, and when we hear it again, it is remembered like a dream, reminding us of a previous state of existence. The voice of nature is always encouraging. And when I read this, it reminded me of the return of the sandhill cranes in the spring. We have yeah. some, part of our property is wetland, and so it's always an wonderful to hear them come back. And uh, we know that spring has arrived, and also that the sandhill crane population has grown uh, over the years, so now they're very, um, there are a lot of them in the state where they didn't used to be. Thank you. Yes. Uh, this is by John Burroughs. I go to nature to be soothed and healed and to have my senses put in order. Mm. I relate to that because I spent many hours in my dad's woods. Ah. The beauty and the sounds. I still think of that. And so you're comfortable in nature, mm -hmm. and yet we have this generation, a couple generations of kids that aren't comfortable in nature because they didn't have that experience. And so we can make a difference there. Uh, those of you who had specimens on your table, any questions that anybody, or uh, you know, anything you want to, observations you want to share? I've got an observation. Uh, she's given me a clone, a pine cone, okay, green, and you froze it to keep it from ripening and popping out the seeds, and then this one's already been opened. Okay, well last fall in my yard, I have a, a cluster of Norway spruce with big cones on them. And one day, thump, thump, 
thumps. They're falling, <laughs> falling all over. And I'm looking up in the trees, and here's this little red squirrel, and he's running to each one, and it just takes a nip, and he's got the ground littered with them. I thought, well, what are you going to do now? Then he hauled them all over and put them in a huge pile <laughs> next to some waste lumber and trash. Okay, now he's got this huge pile. He's making his winter thing. Then there was an old scarecrow laying there that nobody was using. I was going to trash it, and it was full of this synthetic Dacron crap. Well, he dragged that out of there, <laughs> and he dragged that all over to his place and made himself a nice little insulated home for the winter. <laughs> so, talk about resourceful and energetic. And, yep, yep, he's had his stored food. I mean, it was just wonderful. So did the white life. pine uh, uh, spruce. Uh, spruce. spruce cones? They were Norway spruce. Oh, okay. Those but, I mean, do, do cones all mature? All oh, the yeah. conifer, do they mature pretty much all at the same well, time? No. I don't know. I actually, I can't answer. That's that. right. So, how long do you think it takes? One season, two seasons, ten seasons? Fire. <laughs> Fire's involved in some species for sure. About three years. Yeah. So, to, to mature. Yeah, and so actually, that table has samples of immature and, and opened. Homes. Any other? Yeah. I started to move when this lady was talking about pine cones to remove a pile from under mine a few years. I've left it ever since because as I was moving them, I found a big toad nesting oh, under there that had dug in for the winter. Sure. And I found by using my self-propelled mower instead of having hiring someone, blessedly I could still mow my own lawn, <laughs> hiring someone with these fast-moving things that yes, just yeah, chew up everything, everything in our yards. Yes. And I've finally gotten some little small dark brown and green toads back in my yard. And they have time to hop out of the way as I mow slowly across. So putting in more wildflowers so they have space. Well, um, let me just share with you. So we've already done a whole lot of the goals and objectives of this program, believe it or not. So our goal was to motivate you to get out in nature just yourself. Just, yes, I want to get out there. It's spring in Wisconsin, and yes, uh, and Sue will talk in a minute. We've got plans coming. They really are. <laughs> to inspire others to do so, having learned the importance uh, to your brain and well-being of being in nature. And we live in this cool place where we actually can get out there very easily. Our objectives were, when you leave here, that, that you will be able to discuss the positive influence of nature with others and to affirm your own curiosity. So we're not here to answer all your questions about nature. Those specimens that you got on the table are actually very complicated. And so we'd be happy to do that in the Master Naturalist class. But the purpose today was to develop your curiosity and your sense of wonder. And hopefully you've done some of that uh, with your discussions at your table and looking. Use your senses in nature. So many of you have picked up, maybe smelled, uh, uh, just felt. Uh, all of our senses, your eyes, your ears, all five senses, and then beauty, the sixth sense of, of our intuition, all are involved in uh, understanding uh, nature. And, and so do a nature walk. Don't just charge out. And, and I mean, important to get your, your 10,000 steps in, but <laughs> add another 1,000 step. And, and do a nature walk slowly using all your senses, paying attention to what you see out there. And, um, and then we want to explain the flyers are out uh, about the Master Naturalist class. There are two on each table and some on the back and the front. And I would like to now turn it over to Sue Eiler, who's going to do an activity with you on the pioneer use of spring plants. Yeah, Peg. Um, I just wondered what kind of a format the class is. So 
you know, you said it's 40 hours. What does that look like in terms of a week or, or a month? That Good you question. Do uh, and it does say some of that on the back of the brochure. Uh, the class meets for six Saturdays uh, at Harmon Creek State Park and two Saturdays a month. And, uh, and we basically have, each time we have some uh, classroom, it's, it's kind of a primitive room, <laughs> and, uh, and kind of almost outside at Hartman, and then we go outside for field trips. And so it's about half inside, a uh, little less than half, and the other half outside. And um, Sue and I are the main instructors, but we have lots of guest uh, speakers that, uh, in particular, are involved in field trips. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because the field trips and the guest speakers have been awesome. And by the way, there's no test or anything. I mean, this is a, yes. You guys, could you kind of keep it down? Just to, uh, we love the energy, so this is good. But got a question? I was going to ask: Is it possible to fail this? Um, only if you don't show up, because <laughs> they do require uh, a certain attendance so that if you miss uh, a certain percentage of the classes, then you don't pass. But there's no test. Do you have so. to be computer savvy? No. Good questions. All right, let me turn it over to Sue Eiler, who's All right, everyone might. can hear me. And I hope my voice holds out. You've heard me cough a few times, so I'm going to minimize how much I talk because I want you to talk. I have turned out all of these, there's 50 of these little cards at random. We'll see how many we can get through. I'd like you to read them and you can think about what pioneer use, if you were a pioneer child, and, and I've done this program for a lot of students and I've had volunteers actually from the high school come out and help facilitate this. And you get the young people out, and you have them read these cards together. And then you kind of turn them loose in an area, and you say, all right, explore. See what you can find. What would satisfy this need that you have on your card? And I explain, well, you know, there's, if you're a young boy, a young girl, and you're coming to this area, there's no corner drugstore. There's no corner big box grocery store. How do you get all of these things? So that's part of the fun learning and processing. And you find that nature and its um, abundance can serve you well. So at random, whoever would like to read one, don't think you have to know the answer. Maybe somebody will know the answer. So why don't you start? Um, your shoes have holes and your feet are cold. You stuff your shoes with. So before you started talking, I thought newspaper. But there's no <laughs> So uh, I guess my second guess would be maybe moss or maybe thick leaves. Moss, thick cat leaves, cattail. Cat okay, cattail. Can anybody else think of something else? Yes? Mullen. Mullen. Uh, does anybody know what mullen is? <laughs> I'm hearing all sorts of. Yes. This is a little mullen. But we're familiar then we have this tall stalk. And many times birds like to perch on it. <coughs> Excuse me. So mullen leaves are very soft and have been used, yes, to line shoes. Also, I'm told, I've not personally done this, excellent toilet paper. Very safe. Very safe. Now, uh, Quaker ladies could not wear makeup, but they like to have rosy cheeks, so they would take this because it's kind of abrasive. They would rub their cheeks on it. Um, and then the seeds, you know, it has a uh, yellow blossom on the top, many little on a stalk. Native Americans figured out that if they took the seeds, scattered it in the water, and the fish ate it, the fish went into a torpor, and they could just reach down and pick them up. Shortcuts in many, many avenues. So that's our mullen, and yes, excellent to line your shoes with, because you have holes, you'd have leather, and it would wear out. What's another card? Let's have a card over here. <clears throat> Time for supper and you need flour. You dig up the roots of... Oh, you want flour for your supper. You dig up the roots of what? What, can, what has a lot of starch? Cat -tails. Cat -tails. <sighs> yeah, water lilies, cattails. Mm -hmm. Anybody think about cattails? Not an easy thing to do. 
Now we talked about uh, insulation too, so this, this is a, a lovely thing. But yes, way down in your wetland, you would have the starchy roots. And it's, it's not a, a quick supper, let's put it that way. Because it takes days, you've got to let it soak, then you've got to let, let the starch kind of settle, pour off the water, then you've got to dry that. Well, the good news is you don't have to grind it because it's very fine, but um, you, you might have to be shaving that cattail. So it's a lot, a lot of work. And uh, it's part of the process of living. What's another card here? Somebody read that. You want to read that one? You need to carry some corn and need a basket. Okay. So what can you make a basket out of? Reeds. Reeds. Anything else? Wood strips, vines, vines. grapevines, birch bark. birch bark, yes, that was commonly used for baskets. And also, just about any pliable type of wood, willow, you know, willow was used from time in memoriam, also this, and I think some of you have, someone has this on their table. Any, anybody recognize this? Yes, red dogwood. Now somebody's got one. Somebody's got this card about brushing your teeth. Who's got the card about brushing your teeth? Read it, please. Your teeth need brushing. And you have a big day tonight. You want them nice and white. You use? What would you use? Well, I'd use baking soda. You'd use baking soda. But you're a pioneer child. This is what you would use. Now, when the pioneers came here and they looked at the Native Americans, they said, boy, they've got white teeth. And it turned out that for time and memoriam, they knew that if you just kind of strip the bark a little bit of this, and as you rub it against your teeth, it frays and it becomes like a toothbrush. And there's a chemical in it that actually whitens wow. your teeth. I don't think it's chlorophyll. I'm not sure what. Right, right. So red osier dogwood and Again, making a basket of this. Let's have another card read. Somebody over here. Yes, read your card. You just have to have a good cup of coffee. So you use... Okay, a good cup of coffee. What, what wild... <coughs> well, we don't really have chicory growing around here. you got to go down to Oshkosh and you start seeing that. What else? Pine cones? Mm, I don't think there's something else that just about all of you, even if you live in an apartment. This is such a hardy plant that you will see it as you walk out the door. Okay, and, and believe it or not, after this winter, we'll be happy to see this plant. Most of you would go, oh, it's a, oh, do I have this in my yard? What do you think? Dandelions, yes, dandelions. The dandelion root. And again, this is some work. You will get a coffee, you have to dry it. First, you have to wash it. Okay, that's not easy because it's got a lot of dirt on it. Then you have to dry it. Then you have to shave it. Then you have to grind it. So once again, this is not a like, okay, open up the cabinet, I'm going to have a cup of coffee. This is a lot of work. Well, and, and is this good for you? Yes, the taproot is so deep that it brings up a lot of minerals. It has boron, it has calcium, it's high in vitamin A and vitamin C, considered a spring tonic. Could nibble the leaves right now, and if you don't mind something a little bitter, fine. But it it is quite medicinal. Actually, there's there's research showing that um, it has a uh, mild effect on candida to repel that or to, to help the body. Um, also, that it's uh, for osteoporosis because it is high in calcium and boron. So. Your common dandelion, um, it is said that when the pioneer women went west, they missed the east coast, they missed the greenery, and they would take some dandelions with them and plant a little patch <laughs> so that they'd have a reminder of home. But it's also a spring green, and you can be eating this. So, very important. What's another one? Somebody else. Excuse me. Somebody else read one. Who wants to read one? You want to read this? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. You really have a taste for chocolate, so you dig up the root of... Yeah, this is my favorite one. Again, a lot of work. 
Anybody got a guess? It is the most unlikely thing you could think of. <laughs> it's a root. It's a root. I'm guessing most of you don't go tramping in the swamp like I do. But ah, somebody said the magic word. Skunk cabbage. One of my favorite plants. Okay, now I have personally done this, so it's a lot of work. Just digging up the root is a production because you have got this bog, and the bog does not give up what it wants, this wetland. So it's a sucking mud, and you're with the shovel, and you're getting it out. So then you're filthy. Then you've got to try and wash this. Again, shave it. Again, dry it. Again, grind it. And I've done it. And it is a mild kind of cocoa flavor. But if you were to just kind of nibble on this right now, your mouth would be on fire because it's got calcium oxalate crystals, and it just makes your mouth burn. Now. The skunk cabbage has been blooming for quite some time. This plant has a lot of starches. And so come spring, when it hits 32, just think if we could somehow figure out how this plant develops that much energy. But it does. And it can be 12 degrees warmer than the surrounding air. And then it actually gets up to 70 degrees for about two weeks and really becomes a super plant. And because it's nice and warm in here. That's a flower. Well, there, there is a tiny little flower that looks like a rotten piece of meat, and it looks pink. Do you think pollinates it? Do you think butterflies or hummingbirds or bees? Pardon? A skunk? They just smell kind of skunk. That's what it's called. Well, you have tiny little flies and beetles. Yeah, there's more than one, but they come in and they crawl all over it. They're like... The ones that, that also go to meat. Yes. Right? That's mm -hmm. right. That's they keep look because it smells. Right. And so they crawl all over it and they're going amongst one another and that's how it's pollinated. So your skunk cabbage has a lot of different uses, but that's I think the plant is wonderful. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see them right out there right now. Does it have a smell? <coughs> Does it have a smell? <coughs> Excuse me. It does. Should we get another somebody to Please. read? Please, I need a sip. So somebody back here. Well, okay, go ahead. The sun was out, and you weren't careful. You have a sunburn, and you want relief. You use what? Aloe. Well, yeah, do we have aloe? <laughs> Excuse me. Jewelweed will work for poison ivy, but actually, raspberry leaf, excuse me, strawberry leaf tea will actually, <coughs> excuse me, I think my foot might. Okay, so the strawberry leaf tea will soothe your skin. <coughs> I think I. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. Uh, somebody else want to read? Okay, Peg, you got one back there? You have a cold. <laughs> oh. Amen. Well, this would be my first go-to here. Everybody pine. know what that is? White pine. White pine. White pine. Why do we know it's white pine? We'll teach you that today. The needles, so the needles are kind of <coughs> silvery and wispy. They have five little All right, dude. Good job. All right, they have five needles per fascicle. That's what it's called, the fascicle, the little bundle. Red pine are much stiffer and longer, and they're only two or three, uh, whereas white pine have five, and they're kind of wispy. Uh, right, very good. And so white pine. White pine has, again, high in vitamin A and vitamin C. So somebody's got a card that talks about having a cut. I look a, like a little kind of a crazy woman. I go up to a pine tree. I'm trying to just get a bit of the sap right on the cut. Because the pitch, yes, because it, again, the pitch is very, it, it, you know once you get it on, you can't get it off. So it's covering the plant, I mean, excuse me, the, the wound. It's inspiring healing because it's high in vitamin A and vitamin C, once again. And 
you know, you could attend to anything at that point, and you're going to be good. So the point being, yes? Honey. Honey also has excellent qualities, right? Antimicrobial. So, but pine needles, the native... The Native Americans would chew right on the needles themselves. So that's your instant amount of uh, getting your vitamin C. It has a pine, the pine needles have five times as much vitamin C per weight as lemons. So it really is a pharmacy in a tree. Native Americans used to throw the pine needles right on their fires because they had a lot, they had long house wigwam, and it was very smoky inside. They always had upper respiratory ailments, and so they would throw the pine needles right on that because that pine oil then would come into their sinuses and help. So pine needles, excellent source. I think we have time for one more. Okay, go ahead. So, Pick somebody. Uh, you have a headache, muscle aches, and need aspirin. Ah, uh, where's your wild aspirin? <laughs> Willow bark, very good, yes. And we all recognize willow. Some of them are going to have the little pussy willows on it right now. But yes, acetylsalicylic acid. And from the time of the Romans, they knew that if you took some of this inner bark and you put it in your eyes, it actually helps with cataracts. They would say it helps with the dimming of the eyes. So this was your aspirin on a tree. And and gathering the inner bark once again. And uh, it doesn't have a diuretic quality though. So when you take, uh, it goes as a pain relief, but it's different than our aspirin. So this is our willow. Go ahead, Mary. Just in closing, uh, we wanted to talk about what can you do now to reduce the nature deficit disorder? So you can, just in summary, be curious, ask questions, wonder, spend time outside, inspire others to spend time outside. And we all know people who are uncomfortable, who would rather be inside, who are fearful of being outside, who don't know where to go outside in order to enjoy uh, the area. And so you all can make a difference. We have. Uh, uh, flyers up here. If you would like to volunteer, even if you don't want to take the Master Naturalist course, there are many opportunities to volunteer. You, are you able yes, to I'm able okay. to speak now for a few minutes. Thank you. Oops, I'm doubling up now. Uh, yes, we have some activities that sound kind of funny. Cattails are going to be cut out. We've already started the project out of Pope Lake, and Pope Lake is a state natural area. I don't any of you actually recognize that, but it's part of the chain of lakes. And there are, there are efforts afoot then to restore it to wild rice. And in doing so, the cattails, which actually are an invasive species, they're the narrow leaf cattail, they hybridize with the broadleaf, which is native. And then you get a lot of uh, invasives. So that's what we're doing slowly. And if you want to have some fun and be in the water and cut cattails, in July, it starts. Um, also, we have the Hellestead House, which is a early uh, pioneer log cabin built by the Norwegians, Ole and Anna. And we always can use Anna, volunteers. Oh, I do become Anna periodically. But we do welcome people that would just like to open the doors and let people come in. You don't have to be an expert in any area. And this year I've written up two activities that if you do have a yen, just to interact with some people, one is about history of the park and the area. The other one is a very simple program that you could do with children. So if you have any interest, I encourage you to see me after this event. And as we've described today, if you are not a person who likes to do interpretation, who doesn't want to speak to the public or take people on hikes or explain anything, that's fine because you can pull cattails or other invasive <laughs> species, or you can do water, water monitoring or species monitoring. And so uh, citizen science, there are many opportunities. Uh, just to share, 
Uh, way back in the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, ecology uh, was emerging, and then it just kind of went down, and now it's coming back. The four uh, very commoner, some of you older folks may have heard of me included, <laughs> um, the four laws of ecology. Everything is connected to everything else. Everything must go somewhere. Nature knows best, and there's no such thing as a free lunch. And you were sharing in Florida how you could see the fruit of people really living this out, and we can do that here. And so those principles of, of ecology uh, are, uh, apply, and you can make a difference. Uh, not only for your own well-being and your brain, because as you can tell, there's lots to learn, but also for others. And so we invite you to, uh, to uh, browse and look at the materials. Uh, do leave the little cards and the questions, because we'll use those for other activities. And we're around if you have any questions afterwards. I know um, we didn't answer all the questions, so Sue's got quite a display up here uh, that you're welcome to uh, ask. Any final question? Thank you so much. All right.